Good afternoon, colleagues, and thank you very much for joining us on this webinar. As of yesterday, April 1st, the World Health Organization reported close to 824,000 cases of COVID-19 with almost 41,000 deaths. Indeed, some very staggering numbers. Our healthcare workers are on the front line dealing with the overwhelming morbidity and mortality. And so this afternoon, our presenters will share with you on the clinical management of COVID-19. We will spend some time talking about psychosocial support for our caregivers, protecting their mental health as we continue to respond to COVID-19 in the region. I am Dr. Shanti Singh Anthony, Knowledge Management Coordinator at the Pan-Caribbean Partnership Against HIV and AIDS PANCAP, and I am your facilitator for today's webinar. This is a PANCAP webinar in collaboration with the Pan-American Health Organization. A few logistic points before we proceed. Firstly, your mics are muted. If you have any questions as the presentation progresses, please type and submit these. We will address your questions during the question and answer segment after the presentations. Today, we have two, present, two presenters. Um, we'll take both presenters, and then this will be followed by the question and answer segment. We will share the PowerPoint presentations with you at the end of the webinar. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared on PANCAP social media platforms and PANCAP website. Our first presenter this afternoon, this afternoon is Dr. Mark Cote-Peter. He is a physician, scientist, soldier, and author. He is a professor of epidemiology at the University of Nebraska Medical Center College of Public Health and director of the Special Pathogens Research Network. During a 27-year Army career, Dr. Corte Peter held numerous senior positions in biodefense and research, including Deputy Commander of the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Disease, also known as the Hot Zone. Biodefense Consultant for the Army Surgeon General and Co-Chair of NATO's Biomedical Advisory Panel. He has worked with multiple organizations, including the Defense Treaty Reduction Agencies, the World Health Organization, the Pan American Health Organization, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, and the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Carter Peters expertise includes pathophysiology of Ebola virus infection, care of patients requiring biocontainment, and management of exposures to potential biological weapons threats. He has done some recent field work as the lead for infection control, infection prevention and control against Ebola virus for the World Health Organization in Burundi, and as a consultant to the Pan American Health Organization against COVID-19 in the Caribbean. He's published over 80 journal articles and book chapters and a novel, Biohazard 911. His medical thriller memoir of his experiencing managing infectious disease crises entitled Inside the Hot Zone, a soldier on the front line of biological warfare was just published. I now invite Dr. Carter Peter to present on the management of COVID-19. Great, uh, Dr. Shanti, thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, I uh, appreciate the the lengthy uh, description of my current pedigree, but at, at my core, I'm really, I'm an infectious disease and a public health physician. And uh, and so currently working with PAHO in, in some of the preparedness efforts in, in the Caribbean. So I hope uh, everybody can hear me okay. Hopefully this will get the slides working here. There we go, the slides are working. So. As we think about COVID-19, the fundamental problem really is that we have a, a new disease which, is, which spreads very similar to influenza and the population has no underlying immunity. And that's coupled with the severity of illness, especially in certain populations and for which we have no countermeasures. If you think about influenza, we have vaccines and we have uh, uh, some treatments. And in addition, people have some immunity. So these two factors, transmissibility and severity, are what 
are creating such a large impact around the world now. So the fundamental challenges for facilities managing patients are trying to handle this potential surge of COVID-19 cases without any proven treatments or vaccines, and then limiting uh, transmission uh, in their facilities, and then continue to provide the essential services that are needed for all the usual cases of uh, illness that come in the hospital every day, whether it's broken bones, heart attacks, and other issues. So where are we with the current outbreak? I'm sure many of you have been following this uh, daily the way the way I have, but uh, we're still in the acceleration phase of the outbreak around the world. If you look at this graph just from yesterday from the World Health Organization, about in the middle there, you can see the orange bars. There's a little peak there from the data out of China. And of course, China appears to have slowed down much since then but the rest of the world is in this acceleration phase. And you can see the major areas contributing cases right now are in Europe in orange, and then the United States in yellow. So we're still in this high ramp up phase of the outbreak. Now around the world, you can see again, as of yesterday, the hotspots, United States here on the left, parts of Europe, Turkey now looking more and more uh, active as well as Iran. And then other parts of Asia now ramping up, places like India, and then the South America, uh, Brazil is increasing. In the Caribbean specifically, what we're seeing is uh, this rapid accumulation of cases. This is just also from yesterday, now at 1,900 cases reported. But you can see just in a very short period of time, we go from almost no cases, sorry, almost no cases back in mid-March, already over 1,000 cases. Um, in uh, just a uh, couple weeks later. So who is at highest risk for complications? This is our biggest concern, of course. Well, this is data from China, and um, what we saw in China primarily was that as individuals get older, they have higher risk of death. If you look at the far right in this bar table, uh, you could see, you know, any individual over 80, about 15% of these individuals were uh, succumbing to infection, and then about 8% for those over 70. And the, the, the percentage of case fatality uh, decreases from there. <clears throat> now, this is originally from China, but we're seeing very similar uh, data from other places. And similarly, individuals who have some kind of chronic illness, especially uh, some type of cardiovascular illness, whether it be hypertension or, or coronary disease, or with uh, rest underlying respiratory illness, they have more uh, higher risk of fatality, as you see here again on the far right. In addition, other individuals with diabetes, cancer also have higher risk. We don't really know the actual fatality rate from this disease, because in most places uh, we're seeing, uh, there's not enough testing going on to really understand how many individuals in the community are really infected uh, versus those being admitted to the hospitals and those who are succumbing to illness. Now, what we saw in Italy <clears throat> was uh, very similar to, to China. When they had their first cases, they started uh, looking uh, very quickly about uh, organizing across different ICUs around uh, various regions of the country, especially in the north. Um, they're looking at how to triage appropriately and even having mechanical ventilation available in the triage areas and assess their PPE availability. But really from the very onset of identifying cases within just a, a two week period, they had an incredible surge of cases such that they were overwhelming their system in the Northern part of the country. And 16% uh, of all their admissions at the time were COVID-19 admissions. And Italy continues to have one of the highest fatality rates uh, around the world. The U.S. is now in its ramp up phase of this illness, and we're just, I think, seeing the tip of the iceberg, but we're seeing similar in terms of this age predilection for death. Uh, so case fatality, once again, on the right hand side here, where you can see the range 10 to 25 percent if they're over 85, and then it gets uh, decreased from there on down to younger ages. In talking to my uh, colleagues who are in pediatrics, they're really uh, not seeing a lot of cases of this of 
of certainly not of severe illness. There really haven't been many cases in the ICU and very few cases that have died. Um, so for whatever reason, children still seem to have some protection from this. In fact, my infectious disease, uh, pediatric infectious disease colleague said uh, he just came off service in Nebraska and said he's seen the lowest numbers of consults he's had in, in years. So what can you expect? Well, we're seeing generally across the board about 15% uh, of individuals will require some kind of care, whether it's uh, use a uh, need for oxygen or they're having uh, dyspnea to the point where they need to be admitted to the hospital to be monitored. Uh, the majority of patients we believe are mild, mild illnesses that uh, do not require care. And so a lot of these people can be managed uh, by having them go home and then come back if they're getting worse. But we're seeing about 5% of patients that end up requiring ICU care, going into respiratory failure, uh, potentially multi-organ dysfunction, about half the cases uh, recently uh, in a call with uh, the ICU in uh, New York's uh, Bellevue Hospital, about half of the patients they're seeing in the ICU are going into renal failure. Uh, and then of course, septic shock and respiratory failure uh, requiring intubation, sometimes prolonged periods of intubation is what's being seen. This is data from uh, across a number of different uh, Chinese trials where they're looking at uh, Pretty much the, this has been consistent in terms of patients' presentations, primarily with fever, some type of dyspnea or uh, uh, tightness in the chest or a dry cough rather than a, a cough producing sputum. There are a minority of patients presenting with upper respiratory symptoms like uh, rhinorrhea, sore throat, as well as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, but these are tend to be a minority of patients. It really comes down to primarily fever uh, and some type of dyspnea or, or dry cough. Laboratories early on are really not uh, uh, indicative, indicative uh, to give you a diagnosis just from the lab. So patients really do need to be tested uh, to get a definitive diagnosis, but uh, we are seeing lymphopenia. So these patients are probably uh, fairly highly uh, immune uh, compromised. The typical cl clinical course, which appears to be holding up uh, is that the first week of illness, individuals will uh, complain of fever and uh, weakness in myalgias, and uh, they may take a turn for the worse uh, sometime later in that first week. As you can see here, they may show up early, um, early on with a normal chest x-ray, but as that first week comes near an end is when they may start needing some uh, nasal cannula oxygen requirement. Uh, and at this point, you may see on a CT scan some areas of ground glass appearance, uh, mild, but then uh, those individuals who then are going to split to be requiring more uh, ICU care or uh, ventilator assistance are going to end up with uh, CT scans looking more like what you see on the right here, where you're getting total whiteouts of various parts of the lung. Um, so at, at the same time, they're ending up with, uh, with cytokine storm where you're seeing elevated CRPs, ferritin, LDH, IL-6, and D-dimers. This is from some anecdotal experience from, from New York's uh, Bellevue ICU. So, you know, what's being done at these uh, medical centers? Let me just go back here. What's being done with these medical centers? They're really just trying to manage this supportively as best they can. If they need to be intubated, they are intubating them. Uh, one of the things that's talked about a lot is that they're uh, putting patients in a prone position, as that appears to be better for their oxygenation uh, and uh, high PEEP values are, are being used to keep the, um, the, um, the airways open. Um, <clears throat> a lot of different things being done kind of as a Hail Mary as patients get severely ill. And I'll talk about that here in a minute. So um, there's lots of unknowns really about this disease in terms of uh, what's the optimal management. Uh, they're essentially flying by the seats of their pants uh, in these ICUs trying to do the best they can with supportive care. But there's obviously a need, an urgent need to get safe and effective countermeasures because we really have no magic bullet. So I think that should be one primary takeaway here that we don't have anything that's been proven to be successful for, for uh, treating this, this uh, illness other than, other than trying to support the patients. And there is a nice uh, summary document that WHO has put together uh, interim, interim guidance uh, from just uh, about two weeks ago, 
on the management of uh, severe acute respiratory illness from COVID-19. And that's the website you can find there. So one of my colleagues at University of Nebraska recently wrote this opinion piece in JAMA, and I'll just quote a couple of places here where he says, there's no clinical evidence currently supporting the efficacy and safety of a drug against any coronavirus in humans. And the administration of any improved drug is a last resort um, wrongly assumes that the benefit will be more likely than the harm. And I think that's one of the challenges as we try to sort out what, may, what might be beneficial. It's pretty much based on very small uh, case series or people's, people's anecdotal observations. And I'd like to point out to, we had a similar situation in terms of just uh, trying to find anything that works when we were first working in West Africa. Uh, and the U.S. and Europe, and trying to find out what's might be a what might be a magic bullet. And there's lots of drugs I say sort of went into the graveyard of Ebola drugs because they just didn't work. Things like chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, favipiravir, brinsidofavir, antisense RNA, as well as convalescent plasma. So what are the things that are being contemplated for for use? Well, there's lots of places that are looking at chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. In fact, the FDA at, in the United States recently submitted a uh, expanded use authorization for use of these drugs. Part of the, what's driving this, uh, of course, there there is some data from just anecdotal reports out of uh, France and very few numbers of patients that the FDA felt uh, made this look like it was more likely to benef be beneficial than harmful. Uh, but there's also been a challenge with these drugs because there's been such a run on use of these that uh, the patients who normally, especially use hydroxychloroquine for their care for um, for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, have had challenge getting it. And so this allows the U.S. to release this from the stockpile they have. Um, there are other things being looked at, a smattering of different agents, antivirals. The one that's bubbled to the top lately has been regbesivir, and in fact, I'm involved in a clinical trial we have with the NIH across the United States. Uh, it's a randomized controlled trial uh, with placebo control looking at remdesivir, and we're accruing very quickly in that trial. We believe we're going to be done with it in the space of uh, just a couple of weeks here. Lopinavir, ritonavir is something that uh, the Chinese were using. I'm not aware of any randomized data that's come out of China, but it, what I've, I'm aware of it does not look like it's beneficial. There are trials looking at convalescent plasma starting up in New York City, and there's been great interest in that, or even uh, um, I, in, uh, intravenous immune globulin. And then there are various immune modulators being looked at uh, with uh, these uh, monoclonal antibodies. Some of those are listed there, IL-6 inhibitors, JAK inhibitors. And uh, here again, it's not really known what might be beneficial, but the idea is with such a strong cytokine storm, potentially blocking some of the uh, hyper response uh, is deemed to potentially be beneficial, but uh, we really don't know if it is or not. And then there's various things being done in terms of um, inhalational uh, treatments. So the, uh, the WHA, of course, has gotten involved in this, and uh, they have uh, they did a, a review uh, on terms of a, a plan for uh, coordinated response uh, and research as a roadmap. And these different trials were were what they prioritized when they met um, back in uh, February, and they came up with remdesivir, chloroquine, lopinavir, or uh, lopinavir versus interferon as some things to study. And so actually, uh, there, the trial is ongoing, and it's a very simple way for uh, registration for the trial uh, to be part of this, uh, the WHO. The aims of this are to compare the effects on in-hospital outcomes, comparing uh, standard, uh, standard of care with standard of care plus one of the antivirals or the uh, drugs. And the primary objective is to estimate the effects on in-hospital mortality in moderate and severe COVID-19 illness. And then also the secondarily objectives are to look at uh, the effects on hospital duration, receipt of ventilation or intensive care and other serious adverse reactions. There are various vaccine trials underway. Uh, normally, vaccine vaccines go through a rigorous process through animal studies before they ever get to humans, but they're kind of jumping ahead and accelerating the process straight to humans. And some of the things being looked at are, are um, looking at mRNA as a potential uh, vaccine, as well as uh, various uh, vectored uh, 
use of uh, vectors for recombinant S protein, which is the attachment protein from the from the virus. So in summary, it's a disease that we know has very efficient spread, which is why it's spread all over the world. We're seeing a wide range of illness from really uh, asymptomatic people or, or a very mild illness to those who uh, succumb to this um, in a very short time frame. So the challenge really has been that for those of you who have not had to deal with this yet, I'm sure those who are, of you who are dealing with it have already seen the significant challenge in terms of overwhelming capabilities in ICU beds, oxygen, ventilators, uh, your supplies of PPE, as well as just taxing in your personnel. For those who have not experienced this yet, I think it's important to be aware that it may just be a matter of time until you start seeing more cases uh, since we're still in the acceleration phase and start thinking about what plans you can make to, to open up additional beds, either in your ICUs or, uh, or for care of individuals who can't be cared for at home uh, on, on the uh, medical wards. So the key is to try to mitigate this as best you can with pre-planning and also thinking about how in your own hospital management, it's a sort of a continuum to try to make sure these cases don't come in unrecognized into your hospital. So having them identified pre-hospital, potentially with triage outside the facility and getting a diagnosis as quickly as you can, and the appropriate clinical specimens, and then early supportive care when needed, and then managing the most severe cases, respiratory failure and septic shock. So I think I'll conclude there, and I know we're gonna just wait till the end to do question and answer. So I'll just pass it back to uh, uh, Shanti for uh, our next speaker. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Carty Peter. Um, I encourage participants and attendees to kindly uh, submit your questions. We'll take them at the end of the second presentation. Um, now move on to the second presentation, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Claudina Cayetano. She's a psychiatrist with 25 years of experience in mental health service delivery. She currently works as the mental health regional advisor for the Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization, based in Washington, DC. In this role, she provides technical cooperation to PAHO member states in all matters related to mental health as a public health issue. Prior to joining PAHO, she served as a consultant for the organization providing technical support to various Caribbean countries on the organization of mental health services. She also served as the director of the mental health program for the Ministry of Health, Government of Belize from 1995 to 2013. After obtaining her medical degree at the Uni Universidad de San Carlos in Guatemala, she completed her postgraduate degree in psychiatry at McGill University Department of Psychiatry in Montreal, Canada, and her master's in public health from the University of Liverpool in United Kingdom. Dr. Cayetano has, Dr. Cayetano has contributed chapters to various groups published by the World Health Organization, Geneva, including integrating mental health care into primary care, alcohol and partner physical aggression, unhappy hours, alcohol and partner aggression in the Americas, among many others. I now hand you over to Dr. Cayetano, who will present on psychosocial support um, for healthcare providers. Thank you, Dr. Chanti. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to participate in this uh, webinar. I'm very pleased that I can uh, be with you, uh, especially to be able to talk about the MHPSS for frontline health workers during this COVID pandemic. I think the presentation before was very enlightening. Uh, you know, we are talking of a virus uh, that is unprecedented. But at the same time, I think it's very important we take into consideration that the fear that accompanied this virus is really another of a huge issue. And so I welcome the opportunity to um, 
be with you and to do the presentation on the, the importance of thinking about our health, frontline health workers. Um, I want to close this. Uh, I wanted to see if I could close this part here so you don't see that. Um, so my presentation is, since it's about frontline health workers, I think it's very important that we then understand who are the frontline health workers, because they are definitely, these are integral to the response to COVID-19. And so when we say frontline health workers, you know, we're talking about the doctors, the nurses, we are also talking about people like who are the social workers who are doing the contact tracing and their caregivers who this, they are risking their life and they're risking their, they're risking their own health care for others in, in battling these transmissions of COVID. Uh, this health care, uh, these frontline health workers, they're facing long hours, changing of protocols. There's a potential medical supply of shortages, risk to their own personal health, and not only to their own personal health, they're also risking the health of their loved ones. So during an epidemic or a pandemic of this kind, health workers are at the front line. And when the front line becomes incapacitated, health system disintegrates. So I think this is definitely very important that we pay attention to the importance of our uh, frontline health workers and more importantly to also pay attention to their uh, mental health. WHO has developed this guideline which, which I presented to you, you can see that on, the, on your screen. And this guideline has to do with, uh, I think, I guess I can remove this, with, oops, no which guideline has to do with um, the considerations which are like the uh, key rights and responsibilities and consideration for occupational, uh, occupational health. And it's important, uh, you will find that in my reference, because I think it's very important that we understand what are the health work rights, the roles and the responsibility, and the background and the information that is important for healthcare providers in looking after themselves. And not only for the healthcare provider, but also for managers, because it's also very important to keep in mind that a lot of the times managers do need to be able to be cognizant of this, um, of these responsibilities and the roles and the rights of healthcare providers. So <clears throat> normally when we think of frontline workers and you will see these pictures which I wanted to present to you because we think of uh, you know, what we're used to during hurricane and during um, floods or you know in the Caribbean you know hurricane is one of our biggest disasters for you know we start to worry from June to November and so you have frontline providers and the way how you look at them is you know this is the way they, they, they present themselves they have to protect themselves and but when it comes to COVID we're taking a totally different uh, uh, way of protecting yourself uh, because this is a highly highly uh, contagious and infectious disease. We are, and additionally to that, the fear that because there's a lot of things that are unknown about COVID. So precisely, this is what intensified the fear, intensified the anxiety, intensified, uh, you know, issues such as uh, you know people becoming much more fearful, and that is why the, you know all the issues of the public health precautions in terms of social, social distancing and hand washing. So do you see the difference in terms of the importance of caring for healthcare providers need to be able to be protected? Because this is not like when we're talking about something that, you know, transient, uh, this is something totally different that we need to be prepared of. So the, when we talk about the MHPSS, so MHPSS is a term that means mental health and psychosocial support. A mental health and psychosocial support, it was created, this is described, there's an agency called the Interagency Standing Committee, which is the ISC. They developed these guidelines. And this, this uh, Interagency Standing Committee, it, it, it's, when you say interagency, we're talking about agency like WHO, UNICEF, 
UNFPA, all the other UN agencies, and, and also not UN, like Red Cross, they came together to be able to dis develop these guidelines. Why it is that is important? Because when we talk about we, promoting and supporting mental health, it is not only for healthcare providers. This is a this is encompasses other sections. So the global humanitarian system uses the term MHPSS because it's to respond to this emergency. And this is definitely very important, especially when it comes to COVID. This outbreak, it does not include only uh, biological approach, it's only social approaches. We're talking about immigration, we're talking about health, we talk about social issues, we're talking about the Ministry of Education, the community settings. So, all of the settings are very important in terms of providing, uh, supporting their mental well-being of people. So this is, the, this is why it's called MHPSS. So it's not just mental health, it's psychosocial support for, for uh, you know, which is complementary in people who are affected and people who are providers. So there is what we call an intervention pyramid for MHPSS. Uh, the in, here, what is important for the in, in intervention pyramid is to be able to describe the different interventions at different level. So you will see here that there is an intervention that we consider the social consideration, basic services and security, and interventions to strengthen community and family support. And then you have interventions which are more uh, person to persons. And this is where the MHPSS becomes important. Because when you talk about person to person, now we know, you know the social distancing, uh, it's also promoting more of uh, emotional connectedness. So they, we are also introducing the term telehealth or digital health. So you find that a lot of what we're doing has to be digitally or virtually to be able to provide support to people. So the ISC guideline has developed the um, a guidance uh, which is helping and this, this is some of the information I'm going to present to you is from the interim guidance that was developed by ISC, specifically when it comes to uh, COVID-19. So as we all know, uh, it's common for people to be experiencing uh, you know, fear and to be worried in front of a disaster. We understand that. But important here is that um, people need to be able to get the proper information. They need to get facts. And uh, you're probably seeing a lot of time now that we are connected to WhatsApp. There's a lot of videos and a lot of rumors, a lot of information are being circulated. And this doesn't help. What it does is do, it just increases the level of anxiety. So very important, get the facts because the fact will minimize the fears. So this is one of the things that we are ex we are explaining to people: the importance of knowing where you get your information. Uh, the presentation is just uh, is, you know talking about. Uh, there's many unknown, what are the clinical evidence, what are the numerous trials, so there's no specific medication to everything is right now in, in trial. So what important to, the, when we talk about specific stressors which are particular to COVID, uh, so one is the rumors and the misinformation, which comes more, sometimes from social media. And then of course, we also have this, uh, particularly to, to COVID, which is, we don't see that with other pandemia, the closure of schools and uh, children's activities at home, because now it's not just that um, the, the closure of school, additionally to that, a lot of people are teleworking, and so they have to also be looking after themselves and uh, while they're trying to find time, find activities for the kids. And some kids, if they are toddlers, if they are older kids, they also require attention. So this is a additional a stressor that we're seeing with COVID. The travel restrictions uh, everywhere, um, you know, this has definitely paralyzed the world. And this possibly the isolation or the quarantine. These are something that are that's is particularly for COVID, and sometimes because of the issue, the political issue that can also create a bit of anxiety if people are not are not getting the proper information from their from their authorities. Uh, the avoidance of health facilities, 
because you're scared that you can get contaminated and something can happen so people don't want to go to the health facility and this is particularly relevant for people who have the pre-existing conditions because then they are not going to get their medication for their diabetes or for their hypertension for the same fare so that can exacerbate and that, that can affect their health conditions and the other risk of uh, and the other issue that is important to consider is the stigma so uh, it's the people, healthcare providers can also be stigmatized. And this is something that we need to be able to avoid. There was a study that was done uh, um, on the mental health outcome among healthcare providers who are exposed to COVID. And the frontline medical workers dealing with COVID experience significant psychological burden. So this definitely uh, why I think it's this important that we pay attention to them because we're talking about of the people who were um, the, who were um, exposed, the psychological burden most reported by respondent was distress. 71, 70, almost 72% reported distress. Other respondents, a large portion, reported suffering from various psychological burden, including depression, 50%, anxiety, 44%, and insomnia in some cases. So there is research now to start to see the impact, the psychological impact of people who have been exposed to, of healthcare pro, uh, frontline health worker who have been exposed. And uh, stress and the feeling associated with, with uh, COVID, uh, what we're, the message for healthcare providers is that by no means reflects that they cannot do their job, by no means reflects that they're weak. Actually, a lot of healthcare providers are, you know, inside they are suffering. They, they are scared because of the, what it means in terms of, pro they want to do their best, they want to support the, the patient, but sometimes they are so scared that they can become infected and then they will not be able to take care of their family. So this is quite, this is our, this is our, these are stories that we are also hearing from many healthcare providers, the difficulties for them to, to, you know, in terms of they have a job, they want to go to work, but they are suffering inside because of the pressure that they're feeling with this unknown with the virus. So the challenges of the pandemic, as I mentioned before, this is unique and unprecedented for all workers. Uh, and we, additionally, we also have workers who have pre-existing conditions. Um, we are all human, so they may have these pre-existing conditions and they require to work. And this is why it's very important to have a very good conversation with the managers. What does it mean? Why um, they may not be able to, to go to work or they probably need to isolate themselves precisely because of, of those things of quarantine itself. So even so, using strategies that have worked for you. So here, what is important is to use the strategies that have worked for you in the past. How you deal with stress uh, is very important that people also learn to uh, monitor themselves because uh, for their symptoms um, and when it's time for them to self-isolate. And it's very important to know how to distress. It's very important to, this is, if any any time other you know this is a very important time to take care of your mental health take care from your well-being because when people are mentally stable when they're healthy they can do a much better job and i think important to remember that this is not a sprint it's a marathon uh so we need to be able to be uh paying attention to their mental health and the well-being of our health workers uh, it's very unfortunate that uh, at times, because of the work that they're doing, they may be stigmatized. And so sometimes uh, people or family have, are avoiding them because of the same fear that they bring in the disease to their home. But healthcare providers, uh, they also do get training in, uh, you know, infection control, IPC, uh, if they are, provide, they are being provided with the proper tools uh, in terms of doing their job, and they are also being uh, trained to know when they come home, how to strip themselves and leave everything outside, uh, you know, all of this uh, hand washing, all of the public health measures that they need to do, uh, that they, they they are getting training. They're supposed to be getting these uh, resources in terms of supporting themselves so that 
people don't they don't have to be bringing the disease to their home you know you've probably been what following the news and then you find that health the frontliners sometimes they keep them in a hotel they give them a time to not to go home but to stay away from the family because they worry that they'll be in, uh, infecting their family their loved ones so but that doesn't mean that they don't need to be connected uh you know because we want to encourage emotional connection, we want to encourage that they, they maintain uh, close to their, to their family members. So what are the key messages for frontline health workers? So the key messages is the importance of their mental health. In mental health, uh, many years ago, some of you probably heard this word when we used to say, there is no health without mental health. And this is uh, so important now. We need to make sure that we uh, take care of our mental health. Uh, we need to make sure that people have the tools, the strategies of taking care of themselves, that they, we need to ensure that they rest, uh, not exposed to long hours of work. They have appropriate, uh, that you know they have rest between their shifts. They are eating properly. They are engaging in activities that are healthy. Uh, very importantly, that avoiding using of unhealthy, unhelpful coping strategies. So smoking uh, is, gives a false sense of security. We definitely do not encourage that people should be smoking. We don't encourage that people be using alcohol uh, uh, to cope with this situation. At, on the contrary, this can inter in, interfere with, the, with, them, with their coping skills. So importantly is also to turn to your colleagues, your manager, or someone that is trusted uh, that, and you may be surprised sometimes, they may be also experiencing similar uh, situations like yourself. So look for support, don't suffer in silence. If needed, we also encourage managers to provide access to mental health support that is confidential and that people who are providing the support are also using evidence-based interventions. You know, do no harm uh, is definitely very important here and that this is being done uh, virtually. I'm ending with a series of references that I think will be very, very important as uh, um, for you. And since the PowerPoints will be, um, you will get that and you'll be able to click on the on the references to be able to get more information on interventions about coping with stress during COVID. And as I said, this is uh, evidence-based, this is information that is reliable, and that's why we're sharing them with you. And there's also a PowerPoint in terms of how do you provide some people may need to replicate and do these uh, set similar sessions in their, with their community, with their church, with their organization. So there is that information, there's social media cards, uh, there is information on how to support the children uh, cope with the stress during COVID. Uh, so th those are very uh, relevant information that I think are important for everyone who's coping with COVID. Thanks for the opportunity. And then here is where I end my presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Cayetano. Thank you very much, Dr. Curti Peter. Um, we'll move into the question and answer segment, and we have a number of questions outlined. I'll take them as they've come in. Um, and so it's to both presenters, either one of you or both of you. Um, the first question is, how can we overcome the testing availability limitation? Do you think that increased testing may assist in flattening the curve? So that's our first and second question. And I'll take two, I'll um, present two more questions and then ask that you respond. So the third question, what, what is, what about trace minerals and vitamins for strong immune systems to prevent COVID-19? Any comment on that? And what is the current evidence for the use of facial masks and its role in reducing the spread anyone so this is dr corda peter i'll try to take those in turn um so the first question was whether what about testing limits and uh and limitations in trying to flatten the curve my own feeling is that being aware of where the cases are 
is very important. Uh, and so unfortunately, uh, I feel that uh, where the testing is not easily available, it's harder for the, um, the country to know really uh, how to kind of kind of limit the spread because I think we have seen that that there may be potential for individuals who are either asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic to have the possibility of spread. So I think I think the more testing that's available is is ideal uh, because it allows you to know who potentially is at risk of spreading and then who needs to be isolated or or uh, and then if you can do case contact tracing who needs to be quarantined. And we have seen in, in societies where there is very aggressive testing and uh, essentially uh, isolation and quarantine as a result, places like Singapore, uh, South Korea, where there's been widespread testing, uh, they've had, uh, it seems like, better better success in reducing the spread. So uh, so I think the answer, answer to the question, does can it, we flatten the curve? Yes, I think that is true. I think the limitation, obviously, is is the cost of tests and the availability of tests. So um, certainly if you don't have enough tests available, you do need to prioritize them to those, those individuals with symptoms who probably are at the highest risk of spreading. Um, the next question is related to trace minerals and vitamins. Certainly being healthy and eating healthy and getting adequate nutrition and sleep uh, is beneficial, I would say, in just having a good immune response. There's no data that I'm aware of that um, that anything specific is helpful. I will say there there is data for other diseases, for example, vitamin A with uh, with measles uh, appears to be an important factor in terms of childhood um, response to measles. So I you know I'm not saying advocating for vitamin A, but I do think um, just having good nutrition is probably a good thing. And then the final question is related to face masks. Um, this is kind of a moving target. Um, there's certainly because of, as you heard in the uh, Dr. Cayetano's uh, lecture, that there's obviously lots of concerns out there and, and fear and, um, and every, you know, there's, there's now a push in various places to start people in the communities wearing masks. Um, and so the key things I will just mention is we still believe that this is primarily spread by, by droplets and contact. So um, WHO's position is that if you're evaluating a patient wearing a, wearing a, um, a surgical mask as well as goggles and gloves and, and gown is appropriate. And if you are involved in the, in the, where there's potential aerosolizing procedures, then at that point you need an N95 mask. Um, I will say, and that is of course before going to the patient room, just to let you know though that other that places I know of, they are now instead of just having it when you go into the patient room wearing a mask, and in some locations and hospitals in the United States, they are starting to mask in any clinical area for any patient. Um, so that is just a trend. Uh, that that people are doing, uh, whether or not it actually is does anything for, for preventing spread is anybody's guess. There's certainly no trials being done that I'm aware of, and whether or not it works in the community is something that's being looked at by the CDC about whether they might make recommendations that way. But here again, there's no there's no definite proof. Uh, a lot of this is based on um, just community fears and. Uh, and what might make sense by, in just by common sense. So that's kind of a long answer to three different questions, but uh, I'll pass it back if, if there are others, uh, if Dr. Kyle Tom wants to make any other comments. Thanks. Any comment from you, Dr. Cayetano? Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I think it's very important. What you said makes a lot of sense, Dr. Mark, because what we're looking at some of our countries, they're, they're limiting the testing for people who are very, very ill. And when you do that, then you are not having the opportunity to know where people are sick that require to be, uh, to be protective to. So I would want to encourage that uh, the, the testing, if it's available, in your presentation, you said it very clear, you know, there is 5% of people who become critically ill, but then you also have a people who, are, who can be, be who can get well and 
you also have people who are asymptomatic and they may be carrying the virus. So my recommendation is that, yes, it should be available. Uh, people should have access as much as possible. I think that also is creating a lot of uh, fear, uh, you know, the fact that people are not feel they're feeling sick and they're not so sure. And then some people who are asymptomatic and if they don't have the classical typical symptoms and they are, they are carriers, you know, they are helping to spread the virus. So we, I would think that it's important from uh, what we're learning from other countries to have it available and for people to be, if possible, for people to be tested. So I think you're, you're, I totally support your, your, your answer. And the same thing, you know, people who are for the vitamins, people who are immunocompromised have a higher chance. So be, it's not that it's the cure. Definitely, we're not talking about cure. We're talking about being healthy, being well, uh, and that's you know, eating healthy, eating eating well helps because immunosuppression can uh, diminish people's uh, ability to fight any illness. So I, I agree with you. And the other the other the issue with the mask, I totally support the answer. I think there is not much to add to that for now. Thank you. Um, thank you both. A can, few I more add, can I can yes. I add one more thing there? Um, one of the things that I do have concerns about with uh, community wearing a mask is that if people don't wear it properly, they may actually increase their risk of infection. And I just remember when I was in the airport just a couple of weeks ago, coming back from the Caribbean, seeing lots of people wearing masks, but they wore it on their heads, they wore it under their chin, and they were taking off and putting on their mask repeatedly. And every time they did that, they had risk of touching their hands onto their nose or mouth or eyes. And so, that's one of my major concerns about just anybody wearing masks. If they do it, when we use it in healthcare, we wear it into the patient room or the area of risk, and then we leave, we take it off in appropriate manner such that we don't cross-contaminate ourselves. And so that's one of my big concerns about community wearing of masks. Over. And perhaps I can add to that too, Dr. Mark, in terms of the false sense, because I think it's a false sense of security that people have when they wear a mask. And similarly, I see it with the gloves, that you see people wearing gloves and wearing a mask, uh, and it's just giving them a false sense, but they're not actually using the proper procedure of protecting themselves. I think that's something we need to be very, very careful. So a good point there in terms of using these devices that definitely just giving them a false sense of a protection, but actually they can just be exposing themselves. It's not being done properly. Thank you. Over. Yeah, thank you. Um, moving on, I think we've we've answered these questions, but if there's anything to add, so I'll take a, num a number of questions again. There's a, there is a scare that the spread of disinfection is airborne. What is your take on it? And I, I know that Dr. Mark would have answered, but if there's anything to add. Um, the next question, in Trinidad, we now have local spread. That being the case, shouldn't the criteria for testing not be changed um, from what CARF is currently using? And what is the ideal time for testing? Um, the next question what are your views on non-invasive ventilation for suspected or confirmed persons with cardiac failure or respiratory problems like copd that may not be icu candidates dr mark sure uh, i'll do my best to answer those um so the first question uh, was about airborne spread, and I think I've kind of answered that. I think uh, we believe that uh, primarily the spread is uh, contact and droplet. So droplet being larger droplets that tend to fall out of the air within about six feet of the patient. I will mention there was a study done by my colleagues at University of Nebraska uh, that was, uh, they submit sent out a, uh, a pre-published copy just for information about some assessments they made in their uh, containment unit and they did find um, when they were testing using RNA tests uh, they were able to find some particles uh, that were within six feet of the patient uh, within the room as well as some that were beyond six feet as well as some outside the, the door. The key thing is uh, what they couldn't determine 
was that whether that was viable virus, it was based on just PCR testing. So they did try to grow the virus from those samples, but were unable to. So they may have just been leftover genetic material as opposed to live virus. And I think uh, we haven't seen the kind of spread where uh, somewhat like with measles, where you see someone across a room or someone, uh, you know, in a gym being infected, uh, which really primarily those people, when they've been able to trace it, it's been those who've had fairly direct contact with the individuals. But, you know, this is a moving target. We may find more out over time. The next question was about local spread and changing testing. I believe we're kind of answered that a little bit and it may be specific to the specific country that being asked so I don't really know completely how to answer that other than I think if testing is available and the resources are available here again sort of shining a light on on what can be um, what is really out there in your communities is certainly helpful and uh, this is where in places like South Korea they've done drive-through testing to make it very simple for people who are concerned or if they have illness, uh, but mild illness, they have a place to go where they can get tested. And as we're we're going to see this improve, I think now that there are some tests out there where you can actually get more rapid uh, test results within, in some cases, 15 minutes as opposed to days, uh, you know, or a week in in minute, most cases right now. And the final question was about non-invasive ventilation. Um, I'm probably not the best person to answer that. I know that this is one of the sort of, what I'd say, one of the tools in the toolbox you have if you don't have adequate ventilators, if you're trying to keep someone off the ventilator who you know is going to be very difficult to wean, that's certainly an option uh, as a sort of a midpoint between someone just getting sort of, you know, two liters nasal cannula uh, compared to someone need, requiring mechanical ventilation, if you can do things like CPAP or BiPAP as a potential option to try to keep them from requiring a ventilator. That is an option to consider. That is mentioned in the um, in the WHO's guidance as one one possibility to be, to be considered. So I think I'll I'll stop there and um, see if uh, others have other comments. Um, there are quite a few more questions, and so let me take the opportunity to see how many we can get answered this afternoon. So here is one very specific for you, Dr. Mark. Um, is there any new information on COVID-19 scores slash outcomes in pregnant women? Um, the next question, what is the, what is the test-based strategy for deeming patients recovered from COVID-19? Anyone? So uh, I'll take those in turn. Um, so um, in terms of pregnancy outcomes, certainly we worry about pregnancy as a uh, uh, immune compromised state, but to my knowledge, we haven't actually seen worse uh, outcomes in pregnant women. I think one of the major concerns has been after the woman delivers in terms of uh, risk of transmission to the child uh, during breastfeeding, but I'm not aware that we've seen worse outcomes in women. I do think we've seen some preterm deliveries associated with pregnancy. Um, there probably is more information. It's been a, uh, probably a week or so since I looked at there. There's probably more information on the latest on the website for American College of Obstetric and Gynecology for those who are interested in looking that up. Uh, in terms of what's the best way to test for recovery, I think different places have different uh, or have different um, procedures or, or requirements on this. But but uh, what's recommended is that uh, certainly someone who's recovered clinically and then uh, uh, no longer requiring care, but then also who uh, who can be tested and found. I think it was two different tests, uh, 20 to four, 24 to 48 hours apart with um, Two different sites, so like nasal uh, or oral swabs uh, being found to be negative. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and and I don't questions. think uh, about about pregnant women. I think the CDC also were looking into guidelines, but there's not much that we know about that. So I I I'll probably 
think that it's kind of soon, so far we haven't seen much. The issue about the testing, Dr. Mark, I'm not so sure. One, one of the other things, this is another, is to see whether the person after being in recovery, whether they, they can again become, you know, become infected. I think, I don't know if that was a, a question they probably want to understand, but I don't know if we know so much of it now to say that. Uh, I can, yeah, I can address that if you'd like. Yeah. So I think uh, what I, the answer is, I don't think we've seen that. I don't think we've seen any um, reports that are, are really um, uh, validated that that's possible. So if you think about an infectious disease, if you, if you, during the uh, course of infection, you have, um, you know, um, you basically develop an immune response um, so such that you recover from the illness and develop antibodies you've had a um, mm. appropriate immune response and so the fact that you've recovered says you do have some level of immunity the question is how long does that last and exactly. uh, i don't think we'll know the answer to that for for quite a while but uh, i think probably the bigger question is what's going to happen with the virus? If, if you think about influenza, the reason we our immunity doesn't last very long with that is because the influenza virus is constantly uh, drifting. We call it uh, uh, drift of the virus because it's uh, constantly uh, having mild mutations. Uh, and these accumulate over time such that the virus is different enough uh, such that when it comes around the next season, even though we're previously infected, we may not uh, have sterile immunity anymore. We may have enough immunity to reduce the severity of the illness, which is one benefit. Uh, so the key question is going to be, will this virus uh, mutate enough if it stays around such that uh, so that individuals' uh, immune response will not be a, uh, enough to cause sterile immunity and completely protect us, or whether we might have milder illness or some other mm -hmm. um, other illness. So it remains to be seen, I think, is the bottom line. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Um, a few questions for you, Dr. Cayetano. Um, can pediatric telephone advice lines help parents cope during quarantine? How can we provide psychosocial support for those frontline workers as they're currently engaged in fighting this pandemic? Additionally, providing care for those who refuse, should this be mandatory? Um, and a final question for you here. In normal times, we seek comfort in the closeness of trusted companions, loved ones, and significant others, especially to deal with fear, trauma, loss, disappointment, loss of control, etc. With the physical distancing guidance in place, what other recommended coping strategies are there in addition to talking? Okay, thank you very much for the questions. And I think these are very uh, helpful. I probably go from the last one into, in addition, because I, I think the, the talking is still there, except that, and, and uh, the connecting is still there, except that we are not, we no longer touching each other. So I think, well, especially with the distancing that is being implemented, which is definitely important. You know, all the public health measures say hand washing, distancing, and we heard it from the presentation that uh, uh, how the virus is being spread. So we need to make sure that we maintain that. I think it's part of our responsibility. But that does not mean uh, uh, that we cannot connect with each other. I've seen so many fabulous way of people connecting. I see people playing uh, Scrabble by distance, playing Loteria by distance, playing different games by virtually. And that's possible. It's a way, it's a new way of connecting. Uh, you know, the, all the Skype, um, all the WhatsApp, all the FaceTime, uh, gives opportunity for people to be able to see each other. Uh, so the idea here is to have the, to set the time to connect. I know people so having a prayer group at a certain time and so when they do that they're also connecting so this is a way of of, of providing support this is a way of providing um uh yeah emotional support i personally i was in a group last week where one of the person the the member was saying i you know had lost a, a 
uh, ma or what hala so for someone very important and people started to pray and provide support you know now we can gather like to go to church people are doing this online virtually so it is possible to do that um the other thing that I like the other question about how do you provide support to prime to frontline health workers again uh, there is two types of frontline health workers. I always mention that if people who are working there and they're fearful that they may be infected and because of the limitation with the in our countries with the uh, testing, they're not being tested, but they're fearful for themselves. They don't know if they are. There is, a, you know, we can we can have plat platforms. So what that's what we call the telehealth or the telemedicine. They can have, I mentioned that in my presentation, that managers should make it up, uh, um, you know, accessible for them to get mental health support, where they can talk to a counselor, where they can talk to a therapist, about, you know, where they can get some guidance. I think it's very important that it's being provided. And or hopefully they also have access to being tested. So the idea here is that they have a tremendous uh, level of stress is uh, frontline health workers because of the you know the fear that if they are contact if they are being infected and they have to come home and if they don't want to infect their families and so I think there is an opportunity here to have these kind of interventions where they can get support you know by by uh, by distance by online so either having tele telehealth either providing them it could be done by Skype by different medium but that can happen and then you have healthcare providers just as a support group supporting themselves who may not have been exposed but they are working uh, in healthcare facilities and they still need to be able to have these support groups and helping each other how to cope with the stress of uh, uh, this pandemic. I think those were the questions, and I, as I mentioned, this the uh, ref, in my nef, reference, which we still have uh, have uh, on your screen. They also talk about you know taking care of when you take care of yourself. Remember to you know take time to exercise, take time to do something different during the day, take time to you know to sleep well, to avoid. I mentioned that before. Avoid using of substances that are not healthy. And uh, there is also a lot of on, online now that we are we are finding people doing like mindfulness. Um, exercise or doing uh doing different things to doing yoga doing meditation doing uh helpful activities that can help them uh deal with stress and again making sure that they contact their their, their loved one i want to stop right there thanks thank you thank you dr caetano um there are two two sort of linked questions to your earlier response but i'll Go ahead and, and read those if there's anything you'd want to add. Um, what importance do you give to the use of telemedicine in pre-hospital phase? I think it's underutilized. What's your position? And I, I feel like you've touched on that. Um, the second question is, should COVID-19 clinical teams um, include a psychiatrist and a psychotherapist to ensure that caregivers can easily receive psychological support if needed? Um, so those two questions to you, if there's anything you'd like to add, Dr. Cayetano. Yes, uh, definitely, Dr. Shanti. The, uh, the World Health Organization, uh, and perhaps this is something at some point we can circulate, uh, there is a guidance on how to do telehealth. Uh, telemedicine is now very important to do that, but then again, it has to be done under proper guidance. So WHO has uh, released uh, a guide on telehealth, which I think will be very, very important. Um, so uh, if we want to be responsible uh, and if we want to flatten the curve of COVID, we need to be able to look at those, uh, you know, as tele telemedicine as a way to, to practice health. Um, in many places where they are not having testing, they're telling people don't, do, you know, uh, this is call your physician and talk to them by phone or they Skype. So this is definitely important. Um, the, the other question had to do with 
what was the other question? Okay. A psychiatrist and a oh, psychotherapist. Yes, the role of the mental health providers. So either a psychiatrist, either a psychologist, either a therapist or social workers. That's why I, when I started the presentation, I, I talk about the importance of mental health and psychosocial support. And, the men, and then this came from the group that I mentioned, the Interagency Standing Committee, uh, which is a group that brings together different humanitarian agencies. And what happens is that we are looking at the importance of mental health, not only in health, but people who are in education, I mentioned that that you want mental health to be a cross cutting the issue. So even in the emergency operating center, in the EOC, we call it for people who are in the health sector, there's we call the emergency operating center, the EOC. Uh, as you have epidemiologists, you have people, you know, um, you have. Uh, people who are experts in water, sanitation, but now we are also making sure that uh, mental health providers, mental health specialists are part of this, the EOC team. Why? Because it's important that we take care of our own mental health. It's important that we provide guidance and hope people provide emotional support. So I do recommend that this is uh, important to keep in mind that mental health and psychosocial support is a cross-cutting issue and it's important in a pandemic like this that people, stress is, is definitely high. So you need to be able the fear of the, the virus. So you need to make sure that people who are there know how to provide the support. Thank you very much. Um, a few questions for Dr. Mark. Um, first, I am Dr. Pedro Lewis, Director of the National Blood Transfusion Services in Guyana. I am particularly interested in convalescent plasma. I really need to know what's the latest update in relation to using this type of therapy. As a country without the ability to measure the type of antibodies in the plasma, should we still explore this? Um, a few more questions for you, Dr. Mark, um, some of the more. One second, um, please. Yeah. Is there any indication or research out there as to what the medium or long-term effects on lung function or cardiovascular fitness might be? Um, the next question, is there any difference in the management of a normal chest in a patient with early symptoms with limited, where limited testing is available? Um, and a final question for you so far, compared to surgical masks, do face masks made of cloth provide any protection against droplets? Dr. Mark. All right, I'll try to take those. Let me see. Okay, I'll start with the, the uh, transfusion services and convalescent plasma. So this is a big challenge. Uh, certainly there's a lot of interest in uh, looking at convalescent uh, plasma as a treatment. Um, my recommendation is it's worth looking at. It's the, it's uh, this is a big challenge though, trying to see, see if you can get standardized antibody titers. Uh, and this is one of the challenges we've had in the United States. There are trials to my knowledge that are moving forward, uh, but that is certainly a challenge. I would say it's worth looking into, but um, um, being not able to standardize the antibody titers will be a significant limitation. And this is one of the things also being looked at, as I mentioned, was IV immune globulin. And, uh, so here again, it, you need an assay to try to understand what your titers are and try to standardize them, but it's certainly worth looking into. But if you can't standardize them, you can also still have some, uh, if it's done in some kind of a randomized fashion, you can still have some ability potentially to, to get some data out of that. Um, in terms of, uh, I think the question was about medium and long-term effects. I think we still don't know this completely. I do know that at least in the near term, individuals who are severely ill with this, uh, and we saw this with our patients who were monitored in our quarantine unit in Nebraska, uh, in the near term, they are, uh, they do complain of ease, uh, more easy fatigability and shortness of breath, uh, uh, even after recovering for, for one week or longer. So, but I think, 
we really won't know if there's long-term effects until there's some really good studies and there's so many patients there, you know, and we're so involved in the acute care right now and trying to understand how to treat it. Uh, I think the recovery aspect has not been, had not gotten the attention it needs, but hopefully as this progresses, we'll get more information on that. And the, I missed a third question, so we'll have to come back to it. But the fourth question was about face masks, uh, you know, cloth masks versus surgical masks. One thing to remember is that if you have a mask produced by, you know, a, a, a commercial producer, whether it be a surgical mask or an N95 mask, there's usually some kind of standard that has to pass before it can be declared uh, appropriate to be sold. And so I think that's one of the big challenges with something made out of cloth. Certainly having something covering your face against large, which uh, will likely work just to block larger droplets can reduce your risk of illness uh, to the degree that a face mask, a surgical mask, or a, but certainly it's not gonna work as well as an N95 and probably not as good as a surgical mask, but it may help reduce your exposure to some of the larger droplets. Keep in mind that not only is your nose and mouth susceptible, but your eyes are also susceptible as potential sources of infection. So just a mask alone is not gonna be fully protective. Um, there is some data, which I a little bit hesitant to cite, but looking at, uh, you know, single versus double layers of handkerchiefs and um, and uh, t-shirts, historically, there's some data looking at where if you had a t-shirt doubled, it might be protective, at least in some animal studies against various uh, biological agents. But, um, but the bottom line is um, there's obviously no standardization. There's no, there's no, you know, manufacturing test I'm aware of that where these cloth masks are being you know, passing a specific requirement uh, and certification anyway. So just take that with a grain of salt in terms of what you're wearing and it, its potential limited benefit. It may be better than nothing, but may not be uh, uh, certainly fully protective. And I think the third question was something about the chest. I'm not exactly sure uh, what it was. Uh, can you repeat what that was? Um, yeah, let, let me... One minute, I'll try it. Okay, here's the question. Is there any difference in the management of a normal chest in a patient with early symptoms where limited testing is available? Well, I'm, I'm not still sure what the exact question is. It may be if you have someone who comes in with some complaints and you hear some abnormal breast sounds or, or rails or crackles, things like that, is that uh, something that could help you screen out someone who might have this versus versus someone who doesn't? I, I would hazard a guess and say yes, uh, if you can actually uh, apply a stethoscope and listen to the patient and you hear abnormal sounds, that might give you a higher indication that this person has uh, you know, a lower respiratory tract illness versus uh, just someone with a upper respiratory tract illness. So it, it's potentially useful. One of the things that's being done in some centers now, if you have a portable ultrasound machine, this could be useful as well for looking for early indicators of, of um, abnormalities on, on ultrasound uh, if you can't if do chest x-rays or it may be useful in you know, monitoring people day to day and how they're doing clinically. If, if you can't do regular chest x-rays or uh, something like a CT scan. So that may be a useful adjunct. How useful, it's hard to say and uh, you know, I'm not aware of any specific data demonstrating the benefit, but I think certainly anecdotally people are, are finding ultrasounds can be very useful. Over. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mark. We have a few more questions. The first one for you, Dr. Cayetano. What guidance would you offer to persons who are faced with an order to remain isolated in spaces that are unsafe? or otherwise inherently cause a deterior deterioration of their mental health and well-being. For example, domestic slash intimate pi partner violence and abuse. Dr. Caetano. Thank you, Dr. Shanti. This is so, such an interesting question. And, I, and this type of um, situation where we are called to be 
in uh, with, you know, oh, what I want to use it for confined, but you're called to stay in situations where you're not to be uh, socializing. So the, it can bring more um, opportunity for issues of violence, uh, intimate, uh, intimate violence or domestic violence, gender-based violence. We are not, clearly this is not recommendable. This is not something that we would want to encourage. I mean, when we talk about issues like that, we actually, we were promoting that this is an opportunity for people to seek help, to call um, for other support, not to stay in these situations because these situations are not healthy for themselves and for the children or not for the family member. So this is definitely, we're starting to see these things happening more and more. There's an, especially, I think I mentioned that before, where people tend to, um, the coping skills could be more drinking and using substances, and then they become disinhibited. And when they're disinhibited, then there's a more chances for them to become aggressive and you know to have uh, to become violent we don't recommend i mean you know you you want to be able to get out of that situation as 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 quick as possible uh you want to be able to we will recommend to look for support but not to stay in the situation because clearly it's not going to change um so i i think the the, the quarantine is something that can you know you finding that people are becoming intolerant or irritable and that can lead to this kind of situation that are not safe and they are not healthy and this definitely affect their mental health uh, they don't sleep well they are anxious they can become uh, depressed and uh, so this is not something that we recommend what we recommend is that people are um, are staying in situations where they can be comfortable, they can be able to, to feel like if they are, they are quarantined, if there's no symptoms, but they are taking care of their mental, mental health. Thank you very much. Two, two more questions to um, both of you. Do you recommend that healthcare workers who are at the front line of the pandemic be tested even if asymptomatic? Um, second question, I'm currently working with frontline staff in a country that has had no acute admissions and the level of fear is astounding. Any suggestions on how that gets countered and the interventions that may be useful? Uh, perhaps I can uh, take the last one, the one about the fear, right? Because this is what we think, this is exactly what I was saying that the pandemic i mean it's because of the virus but the hidden behind that is the is the fear so here what we're recommending is precisely this kind of webinars where you're providing you're getting information from um people who are in the field who are getting you're getting your source of your source of information has to be uh, from reliable sources uh, you get, you have to make sure that people are actually being given information that is reliable, that is scientific, that is based on evidence that comes from, you know, good sources. So either from WHO or from CDC, uh, this thing helps a lot. And then when it comes to testing, I think that the Marx mentioned it before, like countries that have done testing, they have helped to flatten the curve, but precisely because you do have people who are asymptomatic, they're not showing any symptoms and they may have the virus. And these are the people that you want to be able to, um, you know, to isolate. So I think it helps to put in measures quickly, these public health measures to, to, to decrease the, the spread of the virus. So I, I would be in, inclined for that. But then I also understand that it may be some countries may not have it as available as we would want them to have that. But but that's where I would I would be with that. Dr. Mark, you may have something else to add to it. Yes, thank you, Dr. Cayetano. So I'll take I'll I'll follow up on that second question as well. I think if you have a if you're in a country that currently is not having admissions or known patients, 
I would proceed forward, uh, number one, as if you do have patients. So thinking about how do you keep these, uh, you know, an unrecognized patient out of the hospital, appropriate triage, uh, and having your staff being trained on appropriate PPE and things like that now, uh, such that if and when you do have patients, you're not caught unawares. But, but uh, most places I say, just assume you have cases out there, you just don't know that they're there. Um, but I, I think also you have a, a great opportunity for any cases in your country, if you have very few cases, to be very aggressive in terms of, uh, you know, suspect cases being tested and any that are positive, uh, that uh, any potential uh, contacts are uh, looked for to try to limit the spread and getting those individuals under quarantine or isolation, similar in much many ways to what uh, has been done in places like Singapore and not, uh, not allowing uh, community spread. So being very aggressive early on so that you don't end up in a situation where you're having to lock down uh, the country and stop, shut down schools and things like that that are having things that are being done at places where th it's just too late for, you know, in terms of being able to hunt down all the cases. So that's answer to the second question. I think the first question is a really tough one. I think uh -huh. this is one of the, re this is the question was about testing of healthcare wider, uh, providers if they're asymptomatic. I think this is partly the reason for what some of the facilities are doing. It's not only to assure the staff that they're not gonna get infected themselves, that they're using a uh, mask for any clinical care, but it also has a double benefit of, of uh, that if a individual who, who's infected as a healthcare provider is taking care of patients, that lowers the risk that they might spread to the patients. Um, but uh, it, I, I would say a lot of it depends really on uh, how quickly tests can come back too, because if if uh, someone's asymptomatic and it's going to take a week for the test to come back, it's not very useful for you for the real time operation. Uh, so it's probably in that situation better to have policies about at the slightest illness, individuals. First of all, individuals being monitored on a routine basis through some type of occupational health program, but then. Um, that, that that slightest hint of illness, whether it's you know new onset fatigue, myalgias, arthralgias, um, you know headache, um, you know any type of respiratory illness, then then they're uh, at least evaluated and, and tested or or told to you know stay at home until their uh, symptoms improve. So I think certainly if you have tests that could be done very quickly, real time, uh, it may be a very important adjunct to our just our overall clinical care and management um, but keep in mind that a test today that's negative may not be negative tomorrow and so it might provide false sense of assurance as well unless people are so in other words one test is just a snapshot in time a week later it might be totally different and so so in the meantime uh, the patient may have then become infected so uh, just keep in mind that it's not a it's not a cure all for uh, prevention. Um, we have a number. Can I add to that, uh, Dr. Shanti. Go ahead. It, Go ahead. I think it's very important. One of my presentation, I talk about the uh, I and it's also in the reference to look into the key consideration for occupational occupational safety and health, because that's exactly what Dr. Mark is saying. You need to make sure that health. Uh, healthcare providers have access to testing. They have access to proper um, to safety. You know, like the PPE. You know, all of those things. You want to be able to provide that for them. And then, if they're not feeling comfortable in the situation, to talk to the managers. They have a right for to being provided all the resources because, again, they can be the one to you know, contribute to spread the illness. So I think it will be good if, uh, you know, when they have an opportunity, the listeners to read that, I, I will encourage to do so because it does help to know how to protect yourself uh, when, when you are providing a care. Thank you. 
so we have quite a few more questions, but I'll take the last batch. Um, we'll try to respond via email to the outstanding questions. I apologize for this. Um, this final batch is to you, Dr. Mark. What is your take on prophylaxis against COVID-19 for all frontline workers? Um, linked to that, the second follow-up question, what are the advantages and disadvantages of using chloroquine as pre-exposure prophylaxis for healthcare workers on the front line. Uh, the third question, what's the usefulness of pulse oximeter? And then the final question, is there any preliminary data or hypotheses as to the proportion of cases contracted through eyes as compared to those through mouth? Dr. Okay, Mark. I'm just making a note here of the question, so. <laughs> Um, okay, the first question is about prophylaxis for frontline workers. Uh, yeah, there's been some information brought about this possibility. I think the challenge you have to remember is that there is no proven benefit for use of this. Um, and so if, if it's, if it's going to be used, I would recommend that it be done under the auspices of a clinical trial because um, it would be very instrumental to actually know whether it does work. So if you're gonna use it, please do it on a clinical trial and let the, the WHO know so that information can be shared, whether it's beneficial. Keep in mind also that chloroquine is not a completely benign medication. It, uh, it can be associated with, with uh, QT prolongation and uh, people with heart disease probably shouldn't be taking it. So, so no drug is completely benign. So just be mindful of that and long-term uh, challenges with it here again if you're going to prophylax for long term is there can be visual problems and uh, uh, retinal changes and blindness even as a result so it's not completely benign even though it's something we have used around the world for for treatment of malaria for and even prophylaxis historically in terms of pulse oximeter pulse oximeter is a nice adjunct to assist with uh, assessing someone's severity of illness if they're breathing rapidly and they're not able to maintain their oxygenation, it, it's a very nice adjunct uh, to, to demonstrate that someone's really having a, a real problem as opposed to something like a panic attack, uh, things like that. So certainly, I think uh, WHO has criteria. They talk about if someone's less than uh, pulse, uh, um, a, a PO2 of, of less than 94%, those are individuals have to be very watched very closely and given oxygen and to try to maintain oxygen above that possible. And final question is about, oh, what's the proportion of transmission through the eyes versus the nose or mouth? I don't think anybody knows that. It's just, remember, it's a susceptible uh, mucous membrane as well as your uh, nose and mouth. The difference about the eyes are, are you're not inhaling. Obviously, you're not, you don't have a vacuum uh, created by uh, inhalation through your nose or mouth the way you do um, uh, in the eye of the way you do through your nose or mouth. So that potentially puts the eyes and, and nose and mouth, excuse me, the nose and mouth at higher risk of being an intake for, um, for a viral particle uh, because of that vacuum uh, that you're doing as, as you inhale. But uh, so there really is, we, we don't have any data to that effect, but obviously, if that area is unprotected, if someone's wearing a mask, that would be probably your most susceptible area if someone coughs or sneezes in your face. So I think that's uh, that's all I have. I will mention one thing um, that uh, since I think we're done with questions, if anybody's interested, I did recently write a uh, note. I have a blog now on Forbes.com. So if you search my name in Forbes, you'll see I wrote a, an article that was posted today on, on masks and trying to use them appropriately rather than inappropriately. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, um, Dr. Mark and, and Dr. Caetano. Um, I'll now hand you over to uh, Sandra Jones um, to do a really very brief summary. Sandra. Yes, thank you very much, um, um, Santi. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for joining the webinar this afternoon. We certainly hope that the information shared is useful to all healthcare providers who are at the front foot 
the front line, sorry, of the COVID-19 response, who are putting in long hours while exposing to the hazards that put each and every one of you at risk for the infection. As a result, we certainly felt it critical to give attention to this topic of psychosocial support for healthcare providers, which Dr. Caetano presented on. Her presentation, she illustrated the need for all healthcare providers to manage their mental health and psychosocial well being in the same manner as physical health during this um, critical time of the epidemic. The avoidance, of course, by family members and the wider community can make, the challenge, can make this challenging situation far more difficult for the healthcare providers. And Claudina, I say thank you for your presentation. Um, Dr. Cor Corte Peter, also thank you for your presentation, which basically outlines the complexity in treating patients with COVID-19, especially amidst the, the pyramid of suggested treatment for which no clinical evidence is available to support the efficacy and safety of the suggested medication. I want to thank both of you for your, um, for your um, presentation. And once again, I said, I hope that it was very useful for all those who actually join us. Thanks for joining us. Just before I, I end, because I know we are over time, to the colleagues from um, PANCA, on behalf of the Pan American Health Organization, I want to thank you once again for your ongoing collaboration and support with these webinars as we collectively try to provide appropriate information across the region to all the countries and the territories, all healthcare providers in the countries and the territories. So thank you and um, have a good evening, everyone. And I, I turn back over to Shanti. Not very much more to say, Sandra. Thank you very much. Uh, PANCAP is exceedingly grateful for this collaboration with the Pan American Health Organization as we continue to share information and knowledge to our Caribbean community. As a gentle reminder, we will share the presentations with you in another few minutes. You'll receive both presentations via email. Um, thanks again to both of our presenters, to Dr. Carti Peter and Dr. Cayetano. I think this has been very useful and I trust that our colleagues who would have joined us this afternoon would have gained new knowledge. Thank you very much colleagues for joining us. Thank you very much for staying with us. Stay safe everyone, stay informed and be prepared. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.